Good afternoon, everyone. Today, Commissioner Pichek will provide his data presentation. Secretary French will give an education update. Secretary Smith will discuss vaccinations and hospital capacity. And Dr. Levine will provide a health update and give some tips for families as we approach Thanksgiving. But first, I want to reiterate how important it is for Vermonters to use common sense and take precautions as we approach the holidays so we don't adversely impact our ICU capacity. So the first common sense thing you can do is get vaccinated. The data speaks for itself. About three quarters of Vermont's hospitalizations and about 70% of our cases are unvaccinated. So the best way to protect yourself and your family is still to get vaccinated. It's also important to get your booster. As you've heard us say, if you're over 18 and it's been six months since you received your second dose of Moderna or Pfizer, or two months since J&J, &J, you want to get boosted. Vermont currently leads the nation in boosters amongst those over the age of 65, but we can and need to do better because it's already having a positive effect. In the past 30 days, even as total cases have increased, the case rate for those over 65 has actually declined about 2.5%. Now, this is important because we know this population is most at risk. And it also could explain why Vermont's hospitalization rate remains amongst the lowest in the nation, even as cases have climbed. So please get your booster, make it a priority. Given where we are right now, as we've said, Vermonters should wear a mask indoors. Be smart about indoor events. Use testing as a tool. And of course, stay home when sick. Before you go to a gathering, particularly one that might include elderly people for Thanksgiving, take a test as a precaution. This may be a big part of how we'll manage COVID in the years to come, especially as rapid tests become more available. We're also working to increase access to treatments like monoclonal antibodies to help further limit hospitalizations. Florida and Texas have had a tremendous amount of success with this strategy, and we should learn from them. All of these steps, in addition to the measures we have in place in schools, long-term care and healthcare facilities will help protect the most vulnerable and keep our healthcare system stable, which has been our top priority from day one. I continue to believe being honest with Vermonters about what we're seeing, encouraging vaccination as the best path forward, while also calling for certain steps when needed is the right approach. Because a perpetual state of emergency and unilateral executive authority is not healthy for our democracy or our people. Considering 44 other states, including 17 out of 23 governors who are Democrats, are taking the same approach, meaning they don't have mandates in place, tells me most governors, regardless of party, agree this is the path forward. However, legislative leaders, the speaker and the pro tem in particular, had made clear they believe a statewide mask mandate and further mandates are needed right now. Again, I disagree. But to move forward, I extended an olive branch, proposing a compromise. My offer is to call them back for a special session for the sole purpose of passing a law that would give municipalities the authority to implement mass mandates in their communities. I've asked for this authority to end April 30th and that municipalities have to re-vote on it every 30 days, just like we did with the state of emergency. This was something the Vermont League of Cities and Towns asked for last week. And I see it as a compromise between my position and the legislative leadership's position. I've been clear with them that this is as far as I'm willing to go, and I will veto anything else, because I do not think mass mandates will move us towards our goals. And I think we need to move out of a perpetual state of mandates. As I read in some of the articles today, it appears they're planning to come back, so we'll move forward on our end. As we've done over the last 20 months, and will continue to do, 
we focus on taking steps to protect vulnerable Vermonters and our health care system. Do not mistake a lack of mandates for a lack of action. This is the path forward, and I, for one, have faith in the people of Vermont who have stepped up throughout the entire pandemic and knowing we need their help to protect the elderly and our health care system will take the steps we're asking them to take without mandates. With that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichak. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So taking a look um, at this week's presentation, starting with Vermont's uh, case numbers from the past week, you'll see that we reported about 2,500 cases, an increase of about 260 from last week. Uh, you'll see that that increased our rate by about 16 percent. Uh, that is a difference from last week in terms of the, uh, the steepness of that increase. Uh, last week we went up uh, 42 percent. Uh, so a little bit of a slowing down, but cases still high uh, and cases still increasing, although we did see a little bit of a slowdown over the last three days. When we look at the next chart, we'll look at um, those case rates in connection with testing and what that did to our positivity rate. Uh, so we do see that on the testing front, we remain stable. We're down just, you know, 0.2 percent. Uh, but this week, we had the most testing in the country on a per capita basis. So usually, we're near or at the top of that. Uh, this week, we're at the top of that number. So a pretty good amount of testing continuing to occur, uh, picking up more cases than uh, many other states are picking up across the country. Uh, but you do see at the same time that our positivity rate uh, has remained, you know, sort of high, higher than we would like it to be. So uh, still um, indicates that the prevalence of the virus uh, is high in our communities, not yet uh, certainly uh, decreasing or plateauing. Uh, and when we look at the next slide, breaking it down by age, uh, as the governor said, you'll see why it's so critical that we continue to get our 5 to 11-year-olds vaccinated. They continue to have the highest case rate among all age groups uh, pretty clearly, uh, almost double the rate among any of those other age groups uh, as we compare them to those uh, that are also under 18 and even those over 18 as well. So again, critical to get that group uh, vaccinated as quickly uh, as you can and for parents to do so as quickly as they can. Looking at the next slide, as the governor alluded to, we can really see a, a pretty significant difference that's developed over the last month or so when we look at our, our, our cases by age. Uh, although our cases for those under 25 have increased 74% uh, over the last 30 days, and those 25 to 49 have increased 57%, and those 50 to 64 have increased 63%, we see that our 65 and older rate has held steady and decreasing about 2% over that same period of time. So what that really means, uh, we know that this is our most vulnerable age group, uh, most likely to need hospital care, most likely to need ICU care. Uh, so when we look at the hospital numbers over that same period of time, when you look at the entire population, uh, our case rates have gone up about 64% over the last 30 days. Our overall hospital numbers have gone up 28% over the last 30 days, but our, our ICU numbers are flat over that same period of time. We have the same number of people on a seven-day average in the ICU 30 days ago uh, as we do today. So it really speaks to the um, importance of keeping our most vulnerable protected, not having that rate increase, which would put additional uh, pressure on our healthcare system. Uh, and you think about why is that rate staying so steady compared to the other rates, uh, and when you look at the next slide, it's really pretty clear uh, when you look at the booster doses that Vermonters 65 and older have received uh, compared to all of the other states. Uh, Vermont is about 55% of those 65 and older who are fully vaccinated that have received a booster shot. Uh, pretty clear that uh, that 65 age group is really benefiting from the boosters here in Vermont. Uh, so as the governor said, really critical for those who are vulnerable in that age group uh, with high case counts and the holidays approaching, uh, to go and get your booster shot uh, if you haven't done so already. And those who are under that age group, similarly, to get that protection as well uh, from the booster shot if you're eligible uh, at this time. Going to the next slide, we'll see that uh, it continues to be the same story that we've seen where most of the cases are occurring among those who are unvaccinated. We see that unvaccinated rate now about 3.9 times higher than the fully vaccinated rate. The, uh, the not fully vaccinated rate continues to increase more quickly than the fully vaccinated rate. 
you know, all of the things that we've continued to see. So while boosters are critical, uh, so are uh, getting people vaccinated if they haven't uh, even received uh, their first dose yet. Looking at hospitalizations, again, a similar story. Uh, we see more people admitted to the hospital who are not fully vaccinated by about 2.2 times the rate of those who are fully vaccinated. As the governor said, those who are currently hospitalized, about a quarter of them are not vaccinated, both generally across the hospital, uh, but particularly with the ICU that stands at 79%. So 79% of those in the ICU are not fully vaccinated. We're also seeing that those who are fully vaccinated are spending less time in the hospital than those who are not fully vaccinated. So across the entire population, uh, those who are vaccinated are spending about 12% less time in the hospital. Those over 65, it's about 22% less time in the hospital. So they're not uh, there for as long. They don't need as much medical treatment. Just shows that even those that uh, do have a breakthrough case that need hospitalization are able to get out of the hospital more quickly. Looking at our cases by region, you'll see that um, the Northeast Kingdom continues to have high case counts. Uh, Franklin County's case counts are elevated as well. Uh, and then two counties that um, are, are not on our radar now that weren't necessarily on our radar a couple of weeks ago are Rutland County and Bennington County, uh, where you can see those two counties in particular have rates comparable to the Northeast Kingdom, uh, which have had high rates for a number of weeks and even months at this point. The rest of Vermont holding pretty steady, but those areas of the state seeing increased case growth uh, over the last week. Uh, looking at higher education, uh, things on campus have calmed down a bit. There are 60 cases this week to be reported, uh, down from the 108 or 103 cases from last week. Uh, and that 60 cases is pretty much in line with what we've been seeing uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout much of the uh, fall semester. So good to see things quiet on that front. Looking at the long-term care facility chart, you'll see that there are now 15 active outbreaks. That's up from about seven active outbreaks last week. Uh, last week, we had 103 cases associated with those outbreaks. This week, it's 100 or 218. Uh, I will note, however, that of that 218 and of those active outbreaks, a significant number appear to be among staff. So these active outbreak numbers include both residents of long-term care facilities and staff at those facilities. So when we go to the next uh, page, you'll see that the uh, number of staff, or, sorry, the number of residents in a long-term care facility have held pretty steady uh, over the week and over the last few weeks as well, consistent with our over 65 data. So it appears again uh, that a number of staff members in long-term care facilities uh, have contracted COVID uh, over the last week. And then looking at our uh, fatality numbers, you'll see that for the month of um, November, we are up to 19 uh, fatalities for Vermont, uh, adding uh, six deaths, unfortunately, from last week. And then looking ahead a little bit to uh, what lies ahead, both in the forecasting and for Thanksgiving, uh, wanted to show this slide. We showed it last week, but wanted to overlay some of the upcoming holidays and uh, some of the holidays that we experienced last year. You can see that after Halloween, both last year and this year, we saw an increase uh, in cases here in Vermont. But when you look at last year for Thanksgiving, it actually did not necessarily result in a dramatic increase in, in cases or hospitalizations. There was a decrease around the holiday, largely due to a decrease in testing, uh, you know, a shift in testing, a shift in reporting as well. Uh, but then in those weeks following Thanksgiving, uh, the case rates actually declined a bit leading into the Christmas and New Year holidays. After those holidays, the case rates did go up, as you can see. So Thanksgiving last year, you know, we really asked Vermonters to be smart about how they celebrated, not to travel very far away from your home, to limit the number of people uh, that you engage with and interact with. And we did see that in the mobility data. Uh, we mentioned this last year, but we'll show it again this year, uh, that between 2019 and 2020, close to 55 to 60 percent reduction in the amount of travel that occurred around Thanksgiving, both in-state and those leaving the state and returning. So we can certainly see that Vermonters uh, were able to keep cases low throughout the holiday, celebrate it smartly, and we encourage them uh, to do so again this year. We know we can do it. Uh, the evidence shows it, and we're looking forward to hopefully uh, having that occur again this year uh, by following the advice that Dr. Levine will lay out in a minute. That turns us to our forecast. You know, the forecast um, from this past week, we trended on the higher end of what we were expecting. Uh, so this week, the forecast continues to show some elevation. 
not anticipating cases to go down. Similarly, like we said last week, there's also the uncertainty with the Thanksgiving holiday that uh, we have to contend with as well. Uh, so bottom line on that front, uh, not expecting the cases to go down at this point, uh, similar to last week. And then finally, taking a look at where we stand on vaccination uh, across uh, first and second doses, you can see we continue to rank at or near the top on most of the vaccination uh, measures. Uh, when we go to the next slide, you'll also see the same is true on those uh, getting their booster shot. So across our entire population, we're at about 26.5% of those fully vaccinated who have received a booster dose, number one in the country, uh, but still quite a bit of room there. We've seen the data and the evidence that it's reducing our cases, helping people uh, stay out of the hospital. Uh, so really critical for those who are eligible to get their booster shot. And we're seeing among that 65 and older population really high uptake in the booster shot, which has been uh, very helpful for that age group, helpful to keep our ICUs from increasing further than they are, uh, and certainly encourage anyone in that age group who hasn't done so yet to go get their booster shot. So with that, I will now turn it over to uh, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to begin my comments with an update on our uh, Test to Stay initiative. Uh, test to Stay is a part of a larger testing strategy we call response testing, uh, which is focused on uh, putting our testing capacity at the school level so school staff like school nurses uh, can have access to testing at the point of need uh, and in real time. Uh, we think response testing will allow us to strike a better balance between uh, the managing the health risks from COVID-19 um, with the educational risk to students from being, uh, having them be excluded from school. Test to stay uh, is an attractive option because it enables students to continue to stay in school instead of quarantining. And test to stay students participate in a daily antigen uh, test screening process prior to entering a school building uh, for seven days in a row. Uh, to date, we've had about 35 of our supervisory unions districts enrolled in test to stay. That's about half of our school districts. Uh, we also have 17 independent schools uh, participating in the program. When I say enrolled in test to stay, I mean uh, they've either received the test kits or the orders have been placed uh, that are going to be delivered this week. In total, uh, we have about 51,000 antigen test kits uh, on order for test to stay. As of today, uh, we've had 81 schools conduct antigen tests as part of Test to Stay. Uh, last Monday and Tuesday alone, we had over 900 uh, tests given um, in Vermont schools, and that exceeded the total number from the prior week in, in total. Um, and last week, altogether, we had 2,600 antigen tests administered as part of Test to Stay. So you can see the program is ramping up considerably in our schools. Um, another indicator of that ramping up is that parents are required to give consent to participate in any of our uh, response testing programs and including test to stay. Uh, as of last Friday, we had 13,000 parental consent forms uh, logged in the system. Um, as we observed earlier in the rollout of test to stay, one of the key uh, challenges in implementing it is logistical aspects and that, that primary consideration from a logistical standpoint is staffing. Um, a pattern I've started to notice among school districts that are moving forward quickly with Test to Stay uh, relative to their staffing is they are leveraging non-clinical school staff in addition to uh, school nurses. I saw this approach being used uh, very distinctly in Maple Run School District in St. Albans a few weeks ago and more recently in districts in the Franklin Northeast Supervisory Union. Uh, Franklin Northeast reached out to us last week. They had an outbreak there, uh, resulted in the identification of 150 close contacts in their schools. Uh, Franklin Northeast was able to implement test to stay uh, very quickly in their communities, basically within a 48-hour period. Uh, my understanding is the district enrolled about 50 students in the program, uh, which means in total they avoided the <laughs> they, uh, as a result of enrolling students in the test to stay program, they uh, in total basically avoided the loss of approximately 220 school days for those students. So you can see. Uh, test to stay can be very effective uh, in terms of preventing uh, loss of instruction. Uh, I thought I'd share a few comments. Uh, the Franklin Northeast superintendent shared uh, her newsletter with me that went out on Sunday. It's really well done, um, really does a great job of describing for her communities what's going on relative to COVID. Um, and one of the things she observed, like the larger statewide pattern that you heard Commissioner Pichek note, 
uh, eighty percent of the cases that they're seeing in their schools are among those that are unvaccinated. Um, she observed that they they have seen positive cases as a result of transmission in their schools, uh, but by, by far and away most of their cases are connected to transmission within families or from uh, group activities outside of the school. Um, I really want to you know commend their staff for the excellent work they've done in standing up tests to stay in such a rapid manner. Um, but you know Franklin Northeast, like many of our school districts right now, is really struggling in the face of the elevated case counts as a result of the Delta surge. Uh, the challenges uh, they're facing right now across the state really underscore the importance of vaccination. And, um, you know, strategies like test to stay are only going to go so far uh, if we do not achieve higher rates of vaccination in our communities, particularly among school children. We have deployed additional testing to Franklin Northeast, um, largely to capture the testing interest on the part of families in a larger community. We've also established uh, school based clinics that are coming up soon. I wanted to highlight them. Uh, there'll be a vaccination clinic at Richford Elementary on November 22nd. Um, Berkshire Elementary and Sheldon Elementary will host clinics on December 15th and December 16th, respectively. Uh, Secretary Smith will provide more information on the 5 to 11 uh, vaccination effort in his report. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize again how critical uh, this vaccination campaign will be to keeping our schools open in the coming weeks and months. I was heartened to hear uh, about the strong interest in 5 to 11 vaccination we are seeing around the state. I think this is really great news, uh, both for our students and our schools. We have one of the highest vaccination rates among uh, the student population that's age 12 to 18, about 75% statewide. Uh, but we know this rate varies considerably from region to region. After the holidays, I think we'll start to see this variability play out in school operations around the state. Uh, those schools with high vaccination student rates uh, will see more stability in their operations, and those with low rates will see more quarantines and the cancellation of school activities. They will also uh, see greater fatigue among their school staff. Uh, from my perspective, school staff have been struggling heroically to uh, keep school going and to maintain some sense of normalcy for students. Um, the efforts of staff, though, however uh, heroic, are not sustainable. Um, and I expect ultimately we will see intermittent school closures among schools with relatively low student vaccination rates as a result of staffing issues. Again, I'm pleased uh, the response we have seen to date with the 5 to 11 vaccination. Um, I expect as in other areas of our response, Vermont will be a national leader in this area. I just want to underscore how critical this effort will be to keep our schools open in the coming months. Uh, for the education of our students to continue in an in a uninterrupted manner, they need to get vaccinated. Um, if parents and have questions or concern about the vaccine, they should contact their pediatrician or health care provider. Um, so that concludes my report. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, uh, Secretary French, and good afternoon, everyone. As of today, 15,991 children ages 5 to 11 have received either their first dose of COVID uh, vaccine or they have an appointment. That's just over 36% of all Vermont children ages 5 to 11 years old. This week, Vermont received 7,000 additional doses of pediatric vaccine above what was originally allocated. That original number was 5,100. This allows us to begin distributing more than 3,000 doses to 42 pediatric and family practices. These are all the practices that have requested doses of the pediatric uh, uh, vaccine. In addition to doctor's offices, vaccines are available through pharmacies, schools, and community-based vaccine clinics. You can make an appointment for your child by going online to healthvermont.gov slash kids vaccine or by contacting your local pharmacy or doctor's office. You can also call 855-722-7878. Now I'll turn to booster doses. So far, nearly 131,000 people have received boosters in this state. As you expect and as you heard, those 65 years and older are the groups of people who receive the most booster doses. And what we see is very clear cases among that group are going down. So the boosters work, and it's important to get one. Just this week alone, we have more than 100 clinics throughout the state for both vaccines and boosters. 
You're eligible if you're 18 or older and it's been six months since your last shot of Moderna or Pfizer or two months in the case of J&J. &J. So please make an appointment to get your booster. To make an appointment, you can call 855-722-7878 or go online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Now I want to discuss monoclonal antibodies. We've worked with hospitals and EMS across the state to ensure that this effective treatment is available. And as of today, it's available at most hospitals in Vermont. And we have made it available to long-term care facilities through our EMS partners. Now I want to provide an update on hospital capacity. Recently, we've brought online 80 additional subacute sub care beds. This will help people who are ready to move out of the hospital to other facilities. That will free up hospital capacity for those who need it. And we're exploring the possibility of opening up an additional, uh, additional subacute beds. Last week, to further enhance the healthcare capacity, we asked hospitals to open 10 additional ICU beds that they haven't been able to staff. We will provide financial assistance to help staff those beds. I have two more topics to cover. The first is contact tracing. The second is planning for Thanksgiving gatherings. According to the CDC, only a few states engage in contact tracing to the same extent that we do here in Vermont. And Vermont is considered a leader in that effort. However, the Delta variant, which spreads faster than earlier versions of the virus, requires us to look at our tactics and see if there is a strategy that can be layered on to our current contact tracing efforts to enhance the effectiveness of the process. This requires thinking through both our testing and contact tracing strategies, looking at how we might make changes to slow the spread of the virus. We have the equivalent of approximately 150 full-time people who are dedicated to contact tracing. That team has been doing an excellent job throughout, and I want to thank them. But during the pandemic, we've learned a lot, and we are constantly adapting our approaches as we encounter different circumstances. In a Delta-like surge, we need to do better because the variant spreads, spreads faster and speed in our response is essential. We need to evolve contact tracing to speed it up and change the method of how we test. We will eventually, when the supply chain is available, rely on rapid tests, thereby reducing the time between taking a test and getting the results from days to hours. In addition, the evolution involves, uh, includes education, educating the public on how to respond to a positive test. We began doing this on the health department's website several months ago, and we are now asking people to reach out immediately to their contacts following a positive test result instead of waiting for the, the Department of Health to contact them. This will significantly speed up the notification of contacts. If people need guidance on what to do, the Department of Health website provides detailed instructions. We still plan to use our traditional contact tracing approach, but have it concentrate on outbreaks and vulnerable populations such as those living in uh, congregate settings. We need to evolve, evolve as the virus evolves, and that's what we're doing with our contact tracing. I want to turn to um, uh, Thanksgiving. Finally, uh, Thanksgiving is next week. As we saw, Halloween, did lead to increased case counts. Halloween is becoming my late, least favorite holiday. So we want, to, we want Vermonters to be careful. Dr. Levine is going to cover this in more detail with his re recommendations. But these include make sure you're vaccinated, get your booster if eligible, and plan to get tested before Thanksgiving if you are gathering with others. Please plan ahead. Get tested by Monday to have your results in advance of Thanksgiving or stock up on rapid tests, which you can get at your local pharmacy or online. Be prepared. Ensure that you're keeping yourself, your family, 
and your friends safe over the holidays. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to start today with a sidebar and express my appreciation to Senator Patrick Leahy, who, as we all know, announced he will not seek another term. Senator Leahy has been and remains a national leader for public health, from his work to rid the world of landmines to his steadfast and active support for the WIC program and our nation's children, and his directing of funds for fighting the opioid use uh, crisis. His efforts have saved many lives and improved countless others, and I look forward to thanking him in person for decades of work on behalf of the health of Vermonters. I wish him and Marcel the best of days in a well-earned retirement. Now I have an announcement of my own of sorts, but not about my future, but rather about all of us. The pandemic is not over. I know many people are simply done thinking about COVID, but unfortunately, it is a fact that we continue to live with. The pandemic, the first such global health event in over a century, is not over yet. Thanks to the vaccines, our lives have changed dramatically since last year, but this virus continues to evolve and fight back every step of the way. We're getting closer to a stage when the virus is truly going to be endemic, where we have enough immunity that the virus can circulate without causing huge spikes in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Still with us, but manageable. But Vermont is not there yet. The virus is spreading at high levels in our communities. It still threatens the worst outcomes especially among people who are not vaccinated and those at high risk. It's also endangering our health care system. Now, don't get me wrong. I, for many, we, for many, we are in a better place than before, with people who are fully vaccinated being able to do much more in their lives and not feeling like they are in any strict lockdown mode. But as we see from the data, the virus is a threat mostly to the unvaccinated, but also to a lesser but measurable extent to those who have made the medically right choice to become vaccinated. To those Vermonters, I am only asking that they go about their days as responsibly as possible and plan for future events and activities in light of the current high levels of transmission in the state. We know from many Halloween gatherings and the experience of one of our highly vaccinated college campuses that gathering indoors maskless is the recipe for not just new cases, but for those cases potentially coming into contact with a more vulnerable Vermonter who might well end up in the hospital. We really do anticipate and hope that the transition from pandemic to endemic is not far off, but in the meantime, we need to use our knowledge and experience with this virus to our advantage. We need to remember how to live our lives in a pandemic. And that starts with Thanksgiving, a little over a week from now. I know how much we're all looking forward to reconnecting with family and friends, especially after being apart last year. But in this pandemic, Knowing what we can and what we do about this virus, Thanksgiving can be a little bit risky. If you're a vaccinated, you have the, le the best layer of protection you can get. But with our current levels of transmission, we still need your help to keep others safe. So here's how we can all keep Thanksgiving gathering safer, especially knowing that multiple generations are often coming together and that even younger people can have health conditions that predispose them to a more serious bout with COVID. First, have the talk before you go. We once called it the COVID talk, but now the focus really is on vaccination, to learn if people will be fully vaccinated 
or if extra precautions need to be taken for anyone at higher risk, such as masking when you're not eating. This is always a good practice in a multi-household event when children who are not fully vaccinated may be together with grandparents. The more people who are vaccinated around your table, the safer everyone will be. As a host, you have the right to inquire and set the rules. Two, keep it small. The more people and the more households, the higher the chance that someone could have the virus and expose other people. Even people you trust the most can have the virus and not know it. Three, get tested. Testing before you gather is a great way to protect everyone. You should get a free PCR test no later than Monday, November 22nd, to make sure you get your results in time. You can get extra reassurance with a rapid antigen test that you will purchase either on the internet or at a pharmacy closer to the gathering. These at-home tests are a good tool for this if you have access to them. They come in boxes of two. So if you use them, we recommend using one Tuesday or Wednesday and the other on Thanksgiving Day to make sure your negative result is accurate. Four, and you've heard this plenty of times, if you have any symptoms, even mild ones, please make the hard but right choice to skip the dinner and stay home. There will be plenty of leftovers. And five, get tested five to seven days after the holiday gathering, even if you're fully vaccinated and even if you don't have any symptoms. Now, even though these tips are for Thanksgiving, please keep all the usual guidance in mind for any activities right now. Staying outside when you can, masking indoors in public, avoiding crowds, like Black Friday shoppers. And as you plan for the holiday season that's yet to come, remember that the COVID vaccine and booster, as well as the flu vaccine, take two weeks to be fully effective. Mark your calendars to get protected in time for your gatherings and celebrations. <clears throat> Finally, I also want to update you on our contact tracing workflow and reiterate some of the same messages. As I've mentioned previously, with such a contagious variant as Delta and with such high volumes of positive tests for containment to be successful, we need a much faster system that will enable Vermonters to immediately do the right things. Now, many have already been doing this on their own, but now it is even more important. So if you test positive, take the following actions. Immediately begin isolating at home, away from others. Immediately start reaching out to your close contacts to let them know that they may have been exposed to COVID. You may not receive a call from a contact tracer as quickly as you can do these actions, but our website has all the tools you need to help stop further spread, including how to identify your infectious period and your close contacts, what to say when you reach out to the close contact, your own timeline for ending isolation, when you should seek medical care, and translated materials for those in need. You can get all this information by visiting healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 positive. Now we know testing positive for COVID-19 can be stressful, but using these resources is the fastest way to keep ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities healthy and stop the spread of COVID-19. Now I want to be clear, we are still contact tracing, but as our case numbers have grown, we are focusing this effort on the people at highest risk of COVID, prioritizing those most at risk of serious outcomes, much as we did in other aspects of our response at other points during the pandemic. This means we're doing the same types of case investigations for long-term care and healthcare settings, schools, correctional facilities, and other high-risk settings. We fully expect that when case volumes decrease in the not-too-distant future, 
contact tracing will continue to be the successful strategy it has always been for Vermont in containing this virus, preventing clusters of cases or outbreaks from turning into higher levels of transmission in our communities. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Let's start in the room. Uh, governor, legislative leaders have called for a data-driven mask mandate in the past. What specifically changed this time around? Well, again, I don't think uh, a mask mandate, a statewide mask mandate is necessary at this point in time. Um, I um, are ju I'm just looking for uh, uh, some sort of a compromise. I think that uh, they've been very vocal about it. Um, I want to try and meet them where they are and, uh, and authorizing this and having uh, them move forward with, uh, with something in law. Uh, provides them with something that's in between my position and theirs. So there's nothing that's changed about my position, but I'm just recognizing the fact that we need to compromise. I mean, we need more compromise across the country, and this is just a way of reaching out to do just that. You, you've said a statewide mask mandate that you don't think that would be effective, but when it comes to the actual local level, you know, if the legislature does pass this law uh, and local decision makers will be put in that position, um, some of them might be looking for guidance. What would you recommend? Would you say they should do this or no? Do you mean the local authorities? A local mask mandate. Uh, you know, if a select board or a uh, you know, town manager is uh, thinking about whether or not to pursue that at the local level, uh, what again, do you recommend? Again, they probably know their... Um, they know their residents better than I do. Uh, they know what's going on in their community. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think you have to reflect on you know, what mandates represent. And uh, sometimes the very people you're trying to help are going to be resistant to having another mandate, to force them into a mandate. What we're trying to do, we're, our strategy is to get more people vaccinated. We're trying to educate people. We're trying to bring them uh, to us to get through this. Um, there's a social science to this. And, uh, and sometimes forcing people, or potentially trying to force people into doing something they don't want to do just hardens them, and they're going to resist. So I'm not convinced uh, that they're going to. We're going to see a substantial change as a result of this, um, because I I've just seen. I'm, we we've been at this a while, uh, but the vast majority of the cases we're seeing, even though it's in the minority, the vast minority of uh, Vermonters who haven't been vaccinated, the vast majority of the cases that we're seeing, in the vast era, it's about 70 percent amongst the unvaccinated. 70% of those in the hospital are amongst the unvaccinated. So again, what we're trying to do, our strategy is to try and, uh, try and educate them and allow them uh, to do the right thing. Forcing them, I'm not sure, is going to work at this point in time. I, I wonder then, you know, from, from the standpoint of this being an olive branch or a compromise, how is this a good deal for legislators when you're, you're basically inviting them to pass a policy that you think is not going to be effective? They don't have to do it. I mean, I'm offering this as a compromise. It's an olive branch. If they don't think it is, don't do it. It's pretty simple. I wanted to ask you about uh, public morale. Uh, you know, last year we were uh, quite literally the envy of the nation. I would get calls and texts from my friends all over the country saying, boy, I wish I was living in Vermont. Uh, now, when you look at these case increases, uh, we're, we're not the best in the nation anymore. Uh, what, what does that do to our reputation? What does that do to our sense of um, you know, pride that we once had as Vermonters? Well, I think we still have a lot to be proud of. And I think you have to look at the cases and where uh, the cases are growing. Um, and, and reflect on that. I, I was uh, speaking to another governor uh, the other night uh, in the same sort of position that we're in. And, uh, and when they look at, um, at, again, the data and the number of cases they have, we have, uh, but then you look at the hospitalizations, we're still amongst the lowest in the nation. That's been our strategy all along. We keep, we're, we're looking at hospitalizations and, and the ICU capacity we're protecting our healthcare system, and we've done just that. 
Other states have exceeded that. And, and even today, if you look at the, the states, some of the states that have a lower case count, their hospitalizations are up. So again, that could mean uh, that they're not testing as much. We, we have a very robust uh, testing, one of the, the highest in the, in the country per capita. So we've taken a different strategy. We'd rather have people know uh, whether they have it or not. And uh, again, we're somewhat of a victim of our own success uh, early on. We had a lot of people uh, vaccinate uh, appropriately, and it's, I think it's preserved life, it's preserved uh, the health of Vermonters. But at the same time, we know that now we've learned uh, that the uh, vaccine has waned a bit. So we were one of the first to, to jump in. It's, it's waning a bit, uh, and we, that's why we need to get people to, to get boosted. And, uh, and we want to, to do that. We'll continue to promote that. But I think we still have a lot to be proud of. We shouldn't focus just on cases. Focus on the real, uh, the, the real number, and that's uh, the hospitalizations uh, and, uh, and the ICU data, data as a part of that. I wanted to ask you what your Thanksgiving's going to look like. You heard from Dr. Levine. Uh, how, are you, how are you celebrating and any adjustments that you and your family may be making? Yeah, I, I won't be doing much. I have a, a long list of uh, things to do, so uh, it'll be uh, just probably the two of us at Thanksgiving. So I don't think we have to worry about much in our household. Governor, your thoughts on the big announcement from Senator Leahy he made at the State House yesterday. I know you had sent out the statement, but um, just any reflections on the on the career of Patrick Leahy, even though he's still got another year left there? Yeah, you know, he's not done yet, okay? Let's not uh, uh, put him into retirement uh, before he finishes his year out. I'm sure we're going to see a, a lot from Senator Leahy over the next year. Uh, he's been a, a He's been an advocate for Vermont. Uh, his heart is here in Vermont. It's bittersweet, uh, as I said yesterday uh, down in Bennington, uh, to see this happen because on the one hand, he's a powerful, powerful voice for Vermonters. And, uh, and we've seen that time and time again over the last four decades. So he's done a tremendous amount of good for Vermont. But at the same time, I mean, he's been there for 40 years and he deserves a retirement. He deserves to enjoy all the things he's he's helped create here in Vermont. So, uh, on that side, uh, I'm um, I'm happy for him. Um, but from a from a governor uh, from Vermont, I'm sad to see him go. And and again, we we speak almost on a weekly basis. Um, sometimes he just calls to say hi. And so is uh, he's just a real decent human being. And. Um, and he's done a lot of great things for, for us, and I've enjoyed working with him. Governor, the Vermont GOP says that there could be an opportunity within the next year to, to potentially put a Republican into that seat. I mean, what are, what are you thinking and hearing and feeling? Well, I, I think there could be. I just don't know who that is. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, anything's possible. A follow-up question for Dr. Levine. Um, uh, Secretary Smith touched on supply chain issues with uh, rapid um, antigen testing. I know you, you said that those are going to be a, a critical part of our response, especially kind of in the, the long term as we transition to endemic. I mean, how, how long do you see some of those supply chain issues lasting? And I mean, how much do some of these tests cost? And is it feasible for, for people to get them right now? All good questions. So we are actually trying to figure out the supply chain issues and trying to get more definitive information from the federal government. What's happening is um, the testing strategy for the future, and this is hopefully not distant future, this is near-term future, is to actually have rapid testing capacity in your own home, um, at point of care, um, rapid response time of a test, like an antigen test, <clears throat> to help manage your life, uh, help you understand if you should be going to that event that night or what have you, or if those symptoms that you're experiencing might be COVID versus a common cold or what have you. So um, that's the strategy. The federal government has really been buying up tremendous volumes uh, of antigen tests so that they can, I think, 
deploy them in the way I've described across states in an equitable, equitable manner. Um, we just don't know the timeline in all of these things. We know that they are available now, but there are pressure points on them. So in terms of us being able to purchase large quantities, in terms of an individual being able to go to a drugstore and always find them on the shelf and not cleaned out, um, those are challenges right now that uh, exist. But having said that, uh, it is still a strategy people can use in the way I described for Thanksgiving. Generally, the cost um, for what I've been able to see is for a two-pack, uh, 20 bucks, 20-ish, plus or minus uh, dollars, bucks. Um, so again, we understand, again, that's not free like the current PCR testing. And I'd certainly want Vermonters who don't want to spend that money or are not able to spend that money to take advantage of the fact we still have free testing and just make sure they time it correctly so that they don't uh, get a test the day before Thanksgiving expecting that they're going to have a result for the dinner. Can I ask one quick follow-up as well? Uh, I just want to just finish, can I just finish uh, because I have some other information. Uh, as you know, every two weeks uh, we, were, we meet with the White House, uh, the governors do with the National Governors Association. So we've we put that question, the very question, forward for the next meeting next Tuesday, um, so that we can ask them where we're at because we do see this. Uh, I don't dispute anything that Dr. Levine said. Uh, this is the future, and. Uh, and I, for one, if there is a supply chain issue, um, then I would uh, I would ask the president to use his powers uh, for the um, um, Production Act uh, to implement and uh, and to try and produce more tests, because I think it's going to be essential for us as we move from pandemic to endemic. Thanks. Um, I just have a quick question. As, as we're, it seems like we're potentially heading down this road, depending on what the legislature decides to do, where in several weeks from now, we may be looking at sort of a patchwork of local mask mandates around the state, if, if that's the direction they choose to go. And I'm curious to hear from a public health perspective what you think about the uh, potential effectiveness of, of having something like that in place. Yeah, no, actually, that's a great question. It's a fair question. And there is actually evidence in the literature to show that even that, as opposed to a nationwide or statewide or you know, countrywide approach, depending on where you are in the world, can be successful. So some of the literature that is there that supports mass mandates actually was done in states where they had a patchwork of various types of either mandates or no mandate at all because the state government uh, did not take action. It was all done on a local level. And it was, uh, the literature supports the fact that in those places where there were mandates, they uh, had better impact than in places where they didn't. Now, I again caution you all that this is pre-Delta era testing uh, studies. And we don't really have the final word in the Delta era. But as I've said at many of these press conferences, it's a very different variant strain. And because it's so transmissible and so contagious, um, and we've had so few states that have had mandates during this time, uh, the word is not in about how successful that modality can be in this era. <clears throat> I've done a fair amount of emailing and phone calling to colleagues at my level in states that have had mandates. And they will actually attest to what our governor has said, that compliance has been really challenging. Um, they, they found their population not only wasn't in a mood to be mandated on anything, but that they were, akin to my opening comments today, already exiting the pandemic and not feeling like this was a timely strategy because that wasn't where they were in their lives. And those are in some of these states that are less, way less vaccinated than Vermont. So I just have to caution you that uh, it's had really no definitive but variable success as it's been deployed during the Delta part of the pandemic. Before you run away, <laughs> um, can I say you two, <laughs> two sort of data questions? Uh, one, how are we doing this year uh, when it comes to the uptake of the flu vaccine? And yes. two, uh, do you have any sense of how many Vermonters might fall into that category of uh, long haul COVID people? 
So two very different questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking me the first one because it gives me another chance to make an announcement. Uh, so the rate of uptake of flu vaccine this year is almost, almost identical to what it was prior to the pandemic. But I caution people, last year, 2020, during the pandemic, we really had uh, a more robust uptake of flu. So the fact is, I would like to see our level this year at least emulate last year's and not just go back to the pre-pandemic. So I would like to let people know that there's still plenty of flu vaccine out there. I understand that perhaps maybe going to pharmacies has been challenging because they're a bit preoccupied with COVID vaccine, COVID boosters, COVID pediatric now. Um, but the reality is, whether it's a pharmacy, a healthcare provider, they can find flu vaccine everywhere. With long COVID, I wish I could give you a number. You know, we had so little cases pre-Delta uh, that that in itself was a challenge. But the fact of the matter is, nationwide, we're just beginning to learn these kind of statistics. And the rate that has been given for most has been around 10 to 30 percent, which is a pretty wide range. But if you think about the number of cases of COVID in the world and in the United States, that's a tremendous number of people. And I often look at that and talk about the next pandemic is managing people who have suffered with long COVID. The pediatric population, Dr. Fauci spoke about this a few weeks ago and thought that the number was in the four or five percent range. So again, for parents who are sitting on the fence, not wondering about uh, vaccinating their five to 11 year old, um, long COVID is something you probably don't want to have to face. And there's still a one in 20 chance of that occurring uh, by current statistics if you uh, had a child who got COVID. So I would advise people to really consider that. And the pediatric uh, pediatrician community continues to have town halls throughout the state. So uh, several have been completed already, and I've been kind of informally told that parents with concerns had their concerns answered and actually said, now I'm really eager to get my kid vaccinated. So they do make a difference. So if there are parents out there that just want more information, and want a trusted pediatrician from their part of the state. These are all of, uh, the dates are all available on the uh, Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics website. Do you have to move to the phone? So maybe there's just somebody who hasn't asked a question in the room. Dr. Levine, if you don't mind, I've asked one more question of you here. You did briefly mention, you know, do I have the common cold? Do I have COVID? With the winter months pre-pandemic, the cold just sort of came with the territory here. So what is the guidance you can share with people, you know, even if you think this is just a cold, yeah. the guidance you can share? So at a time when community transmission is as high as it is, not just in Vermont, but throughout most of the country for that matter, uh, the strategy really should be uh, protect yourself, protect your family and others by knowing as early as possible whether you have COVID or not. So if you have symptoms that you wonder are the common cold, whether you're vaccinated or not, um, you should probably get yourself tested either through our site or through the antigen testing as I described. All right, we're gonna move to the phones. It is uh, already after one and we have 15 people in the queue. So I would ask folks to um, keep to the two questions we offered. Starting with Chris Roy at the Newport Daily Express. Chris, Newport Daily Express. All right, we will go to Greg at the County Courier. Governor, um, in regard to calling the legislature back, uh, it's, it's widely known that you strive to, for savings in state government, but uh, calling the legislature back for, what, 45 days early for, for one action that really you could take yourself, 
uh, and then they could finalize in January. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, that money could go to housing the homeless, reducing taxes. Some people have suggested that your inaction is just pure stubbornness and, and at the financial cost of Vermonters. I, I wonder how you would address that. Well, again, it's just a, a compromise. I, I think in this day and age, uh, they, are, they have made their position quite clear. They think a statewide mandate is important. Statewide mandates uh, uh, should be imposed, whether it's a mass mandate or other uh, mandates, and I don't agree. So at times, um, because of the, uh, the amount of work we have to do together over the next few months, I thought it was an opportunity uh, to, to meet them where they are and to give them something uh, so that we can move into the session seamlessly uh, and try to get the work done for the people. So I don't see it as a waste of time or money. Um, and if they don't, uh, again, uh, they don't see the need at this point and they want to try to impose uh, further restrictions, uh, then I'm willing to go. Uh, they can do that in January. but uh, And they don't have to meet right now, but it's totally up to them. Uh, but you could institute something that isn't... If, if I was willing uh, to do so, that goes against everything that I have said. I think I've, I've made my position very clear. I don't believe that we need to impose any mandates at this point in time. We don't have a state of emergency. I'm not going to enact my, my uh, emergency powers to do so. So that would be what I'd have to do, and I'm not willing to do it. So this is the only path forward uh, to give, us, uh, give them something uh, in uh, in regards to what they want, so that's what I'm doing. Okay, um, I, I want to just touch on the test the state program. Uh, as Secretary French mentioned, many of these programs are being conducted out of the school setting. I'm wondering if if you're looking at this as maybe leading into later on a, a test the state type of program for adults in the general workforce who become a close contact but, but want to get tested on a daily basis in order to, to go back to work. Is that, is that something you see in the future? Yeah. In fact, I, I mentioned that in my remarks that I think this is uh, the future. I think antigen testing, rapid testing at, at home is going to be part of the answer. So we need the supply chain to catch up. Uh, they need to be affordable. Uh, I believe that there are going to be some uh, businesses that it will require this and supply them. I think this is the future. Uh, it's going to be the future until we get through this, which is going to be, you know, months, maybe years, uh, and not uh, days and weeks. Uh, but to be clear, that's not something that can happen now, e even with the programs that are outside of the school setting. Well, again, I, I think that it's something that we're transitioning towards. Uh, we have to make sure that we have the supply chain to do that. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I'm going to be bringing up. Um, and we've asked them to discuss in uh, next Tuesday's briefing with the governors from the White House. So we'll find out more then. Um, hopefully they, uh, they have a huge stockpile and uh, that they're building upon and that they'll be able to distribute that to the states. Because again, I feel this is the future. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. To Guy Page at the Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Uh, you, you just said that there could be a Vermont Republican senator. Uh, could that be you? It couldn't be me. No. Um, no, I, I'm I'm out of this one. Um, but there could be. I just don't know who it is. But um, we'll see. Okay. Um, Secretary Smith said that there is a staffing shortage for hospital beds. Uh, to what extent is the shortage of nurses and other hands-on care staff due to hospital vaccination requirements? And do you expect it to worsen as we near January 4th, the Biden administration deadline for 100% hospital employment vaccination? Yeah, I'll let Secretary Smith answer that one. Guy, as you know, um, 
throughout the United States, we have a nursing shortage. We've had a nursing shortage before the pandemic started, but we it's been acutely sort of recognized as the pandemic is going on. These beds have not been um, unstaffed because of any sort of vaccine sort of mandate. They've been unstaffed because they haven't been able to get the nurses to staff them up or the cost of the nurses to get them up, like in traveling nurses, has been so exorbitantly high that it's been difficult to get them. We have said we will help you out uh, financially to try to find those nurses across the United States in terms of it. But in, uh, I have not heard that it's been vaccination related. I just wondered, I know a lot of states are saying, uh, come here, don't, and you don't need to worry about a uh, vaccination requirement. I just wonder if we've lost any nurses due to that. Yeah, but do, you've got to remember the vaccination status for the most of the healthcare facilities, especially hospitals, is probably going to be nationwide given the Medicaid and uh, Medicare mandates that are coming down from the national government. So I don't think um, that is the issue we're seeing here. Okay, thank you. Joe Gresser, the Barton Chronicle. Joe Gresser, Barton Chronicle. All right, we'll move to Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Uh, thank you, Governor. With Congress taking so long to get this infrastructure bill finally signed by the president, uh, what has that done to some of the project timelines that you've had in place, uh, hoping that the funding would come sooner? Yeah, I don't think it's impacted us uh, in terms of the maybe the traditional infrastructure. Um, we have uh, we had that in place beforehand. We got through this season. We're in the same in this fiscal year. Um, but certainly this is coming at a good time for us because we're so seasonal uh, here in Vermont and uh, our season is just about run out in terms of construction, traditional construction. So um, we're in good shape uh, in that regard and uh, we'll uh, be looking forward uh, to receiving all of the funding to, uh, to increase the number of, uh, of roads and bridges as well as uh, climate change initiatives uh, and broadband. I think this is all good news for us here in Vermont. What's your feeling on the progress with the broadband effort so far? Well, they're laying the groundwork. I think the broadband board uh, has done a tremendous amount of work uh, thus far, and uh, the other CUDs are working with them and as well as with uh, private entities. So uh, I think we're you know, laying the groundwork, uh, and uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to put a lot of fiber in the ground in the coming year to two years uh, to meet our goals. But uh, it's all going to come down to. I mean, I, I'm still concerned. Uh, whatever it is, whether it's uh, traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, etc., or broadband or climate change initiatives, uh, concerning the workforce, um, we are still struggling, and we are going to continue to struggle. Uh, we need, uh, you know, as we've seen pre-pandemic, we had a workforce shortage and uh, the pandemic has exacerbated that. And so we're going to be plagued with that. And that's why this session, we need to, we need to work together I knew, with the legislature uh, to come up uh, with ways to attract more people to Vermont, uh, especially to grow the workforce. So. Um, look forward to that. Uh, we again, we're faced with the problem before the pandemic, uh, but it's gotten uh, much worse since. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Hello, this is a question about PCR testing um, as we go into winter. Currently, for people in the Mad River Valley, our closest testing site is in Waterbury, and that is a 30 to 40 mile round trip which takes 50 to 60 minutes. We're curious here if there will be anything closer as we go into winter, because not everybody can take 60 minutes out of their day. I understand that Sugarbush has been reaching out to the Department of Health about the possibility of hosting an ongoing winter testing site in Warren on the Sugarbush Access Road. Is that a possibility? 
I'll let Secretary Smith answer, but, uh, but again, I would uh, offer that antigen testing uh, may be part of the strategy as well. Yeah, Lisa, let me look into um, the ability to deliver tests closer to um, the area that you're describing. And the, the, gov the governor is absolutely right. I mean, there is a fundamental shift going on here um, that we have to acknowledge and implement. And uh, depending on supply chain, that will be, um, you'll be seeing that in the very near future, I think, this fundamental sw switch, which brings a lot of testing capability, or at least will try to bring a lot of testing capability right to your front door or at least near your front door. So let me uh, check on the availability of PCR in the area that you just described. Thank you. That's the Mad River Valley. And then I just had a quick question, and I'm not sure who is collecting this data on um, COVID cases in schools. The state COVID pre-K to 12 website showed six, uh, 12 cases as of November 15th, and our school district has reported 23 cases as of November 15th. That's a pretty significant lag. And when we asked about this before, we were told it's simply a reporting metric. Can you, can probably Secretary French clarify how that reporting metric works? Yeah, hi, Lisa. Thank you for the question. I do remember when you asked that a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it would be helpful if I took my mask off. Um, yeah, I do remember when you asked that a couple of weeks ago, and it is, um, I think, it's, it, firstly, it's a partnership with the health department that monitors that, but I've, I've heard that question more frequently from several different districts. Um, so I, I could just hazard a guess at this point, but we have to dig deeper into it. But I think there is a, a bit of a lag time, perhaps, with the number of cases that we're seeing. There's also, I think, with a, the sort of proliferation of other testing opportunities going on, uh, particularly over the counter, as was alluded to earlier, um, you know, sometimes I'm hearing from schools that, you know, parents are determining they have a case through an over-the-counter test kit, and that's not necessarily a case that was confirmed through the state testing process, so there's some variability as well. But I think it's just the volume of uh, cases that we're seeing, and uh, it will certainly endeavor to do a better job in that, but that would be my guess at this point. Thank you. That's it for me. Kevin Cullen, the Boston Globe. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, your decision not to contest the seat that Senator Leahy will vacate comes just after New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu announced that he will not challenge Senator Hassan. Both you and uh, Governor Sununu have regularly bemoaned partisan gridlock and the lack of civility in Washington, but I'd ask, how does that change if more moderate voices like yours aren't heard in Washington? Yeah, uh, I, you know, Kevin, you make a good point. I, I think there needs to be more moderate, more centrist in Washington. I just choose not to be one of them. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, it takes uh, a different, maybe style, maybe uh, a different approach um, than, than I'm willing to contend with. I mean, it's, uh, it's an uphill battle and, and to be that regardless of this isn't partisan, uh, a moderate centrist in Washington is amongst the minority, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, I've served my entire political life in the minority, and I'm not sure that I want to jump into uh, that uh, quagmire, uh, so to speak. Lastly, Governor, have, have you talked to Governor Sununu about this very issue? Uh, we have discussed this in the past, um, but, uh, but not of late. I, I haven't spoken to him um, since he made his announcement and made his decision, but uh, we, we've talked a little bit about it in the past. Very good. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. I wonder if um, Secretary Smith has an update on any uh, advances in the homeless housing and whether any commercial or office buildings of which there are a lot vacant right now might be uh, considered or available. Have you got one, Tim? Uh, yeah, there's a lot right here in Chittenden County, actually, Governor, but of course they're not that not really suitable, a lot of them, but, but perhaps there are. I think that's a part of the issue as well, is uh, trying to um, renovate and rehabilitate to the standards needed with all the facilities. It's, it's, you know, it's just very difficult, very expensive. 
and time consuming. But I'll let Secretary Smith answer. Yeah, Tim, I, I don't have any updates, and um, I'll check with DCF just to make sure if there are any updates. But I'm, I haven't had any updates on that. As you know, we have changed the adverse weather um, policy to make sure that it doesn't go day to day, that we put it into place uh, just before Thanksgiving, and it, it goes for 100 days after that. Um, but that's the only update that I have on, the, um, uh, on that issue. Does it appear there's enough um, hotel motels at this point to, to serve the people that, that choose to go in that direction? We've we've had challenges with hotel motels um, in the you know in the recent past, and I haven't gotten an update of where we are on on that in terms of today. But I know we've had challenges. I know that we've had. Uh, people that want to come into the program, that qualify for the, uh, that come into the program, and we don't have the hotel space for them. But we've been looking uh, for hotel space. We continue to look for hotel space uh, for the winter, uh, and we will continue. Like I said last time, where I think the best promise for us is looking at uh, vacant facilities uh, that may be eligible to be converted over the winter time period. We. You know, I talked last time, maybe a college dorm that isn't being used or something along that line. We do have 500 people in sh shelters right now. We'd like to increase that shelter-like capacity uh, to another 500. That's why we're looking at these type of um, facilities around the, the state. But you got to think of what, we, what we're doing. We have about 1,400 in hotel motels. We have 500 in uh, shelters right at the moment. We estimate that um, you know, there, there, there aren't that many people left that are looking for facilities, but we need probably about 500 um, more, um, uh, you know, 500 uh, to, to accommodate 500 more people. That's, that's what we're looking at, where we think we have about 200 that are still out there. And just remember, Tim, some will never get. Some don't want to come into the shelters, and that's that's an important aspect of uh, of what we're finding as well. All right, thank you very much. Allison, seven days. Hi, I think this is also a question for Secretary Smith. Um, I'm wondering if there's certain parts of the state that are lagging in vaccine signups for kids, um, and if so, what the state is is trying to do to target those areas. Either Secretary Smith or Secretary French. Hi, uh, this is Secretary French. I think it's too early to tell. Um, you know, it's really been going well, but it's uh, nonstop problem solving uh, on the part of the state, also on the part of local school districts to meet the demand, which is, again, really good to see. Um, but I don't think the larger trend is apparent yet, but it's something we'll, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on. As I mentioned in my remarks today, um, the vaccination rate that we have for the 12 to 18 population is high as a state average, but does vary considerably region to region. Um, I would be surprised to see the 5 to 11 rate not similarly vary. So it's something we'll have to monitor. But right now, the, the, the vaccination clinic campaign is going exceedingly well. Okay, thank you. Leora, VT Digger. Yeah, hi. I have a question about the ICU beds. Um, you guys have mentioned that you added or that you reopened 10 ICU beds that were unstaffed, uh, where are the beds? And, and also, how many more beds can we sort of realistically open if we need to? Secretary Smith. <clears throat> they are, as we mentioned, there are several types of beds that we're looking at. One is to open up uh, hotel, uh, hotel <laughs> uh, hospital capacity. We are looking at how do we move people that don't need to be in a hospital but need some level of care called subacute care out of the hospital into other facilities. We've done that um, in the first round uh, in about moving about 80 patients out of hospitals across sort of the, the, the state, moving 80 patients out of hospitals to, uh, 
to either long-term care facilities or rehab facilities. We're looking at moving more of those subacute, maybe up to 80 again, uh, subacute uh, patients out of uh, long-term, uh, excuse me, out of hospitals. That will open up uh, hospital beds uh, within the hospitals and ability to uh, manage any sort of uh, non-ICU patients that are coming in. On the ICU, um, we've put out, well, this will happen Friday evening. I had a, um, a Friday afternoon and Friday, Friday morning, Friday afternoon and Friday evening, I had discussions with both the hospital CEOs and um, the hospital association. And basically what I said is we did, we did a um, survey to find out how many hospital beds are out there that can be opened and be, uh, and they're not open because they're not staffed. And then we came up with a formula for the next three months of how we could participate in helping finance, finding nurses, critical care nurses and respiratory therapists to open up those 10 beds. Those are spread out um, over uh, about five hospitals throughout the state. I don't have the list in, in, my, uh, in my mind, but I will, um, I will make sure that you get the name of those hospitals. Thank you. One last question. Um, how many cases are uh, staff versus um, residents in long-term care facilities right now? Yeah, I'll turn to Commissioner Pichek on that and see if he has that. Thank you. So we don't have the, the exact percentage, but it's somewhere close to 70% staff and 30%, you know, give or take um, residents based on the data that we saw this morning. Thank you very much. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, for Secretary French, um, returning to the subject of schools with lower vaccination rates, uh, you mentioned some schools are experiencing staff fatigue and will likely see operational disruption uh, in the weeks ahead. How are schools dealing with that fatigue now and what resources are available to them? And do schools have latitude to shift to remote learning and still meet their required number of education days? Yeah, I think uh, there's a variety of strategies going on. And I, I would say the fatigue is, is fairly widespread across the system. Um, you know, Delta, no one could have anticipated the challenge that it would pose to things like contact tracing and contact tracing in particular to, to sort of just highlight uh, Secretary Smith's comments earlier on the need to iterate on contact tracing. We've made at least, I think, three changes in contact tracing precisely because of our experience with managing uh, essentially the speed and uh, increased contagion of the Delta variant in schools. Um, so I think it's important that uh, as we said in our last iteration on contact tracing, that schools really uh, strive to implement the contact tracing strategies that we've described, move away from things like contact tracing outdoors, uh, try as best as possible, particularly at the elementary level, to implement the three feet um, as opposed to whole classroom. Uh, so some things there that can be done. I think the, uh, the issue of test to stay in particular is a really promising strategy, as you've heard today. Um, that what I've seen is a success pattern there is really uh, requiring and utilizing uh, sort of the non-clinical staff of schools. Uh, I was thinking of the St. Albans situation where they essentially used their central office staff to implement test to stay. Uh, so those, those kinds of local options need to be worked through. We are uh, working at the state level to secure some temporary staff, uh, temporary hiring staff that could be available. Um, and I think after the first of the year, uh, particularly if the 5 through 11 campaign rolls out very successfully, we'll see places that are going to need more support than others. And I think our disposition at the state level uh, would then shift to sort of a targeted uh, approach where we can come in with the team and help a specific district work through some of the logistical challenges. Um, in terms of remote learning, just to underscore that, um, you know, we're operating under our existing regulation. Uh, which in the regulation I'm speaking to speaks to the minimum number of days that student, schools must be in operation for schools, uh, for students, and that's 175 days a year. In the law, it's, that's defined as when a majority of the students are physically present in the school. Uh, so we don't have the ability to necessarily count, uh, if a whole school was in robot learning, we don't have the ability to count that as a attendance day. Um, but nonetheless, schools are using remote learning to keep students connected and so forth, and that's perfectly acceptable. 
Um, in terms of the uh, statutory and regulatory requirement, uh, we are poised to have a waiver process, an expedited waiver process available um, starting around February. That's when the regulation kicks in. Uh, the state board uh, did grant that authority to me. So um, we'll have that available for schools. But um, at this point, remote learning is being utilized, but it's not necessarily available to count towards the uh, minimal attendance requirements. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and then, uh, Governor, or perhaps uh, Commissioner Pichek, um, the slide uh, in the modeling deck that compared case trends this fall to last year, um, it was pointed out that starting in mid-November last year, cases seemed to plateau and drift a little bit lower. Um, I know that recreational sports were shut down uh, just about this day last year. Uh, with cases being so prevalent now among kids, and winter sports gearing up um, really with a, a, a variable use of masking. It, is this a point of concern and a potential flashpoint for new cases going forward? Well, again, I mean, things were much different a year ago in many different regards. We had, um, we had mandates still in place uh, at that point. Um, but I would also, offer uh, that uh, the indoor sports, uh, I believe, uh, and Secretary Moore can, isn't on the line, so she can't tell me. Um, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I believe uh, that indoor sports, uh, you do have to be masked. So there isn't uh, across the board. So I don't believe there's any uh, variable there. Uh, well, I think a number of uh, locations and uh, sporting groups are interpreting the guidance as recommendations and not necessarily something that needs to be strictly adhered to. Yeah, I, that, that could be true for the school districts uh, themselves. Maybe Secretary French yeah. uh, could comment on that. Yeah, with our, uh, just to, your point of comparison to last year, of course, I think the big difference is vaccination, which we didn't have in our toolkit last year. Um, but you know, we, you're right, we do have recommendations. Specifically, I'll speak to the school recommendations, which I think Secretary Moore, if she were available, would underscore are the same for recreational sports. They are recommendations, uh, but we strongly recommend that uh, athletes get vaccinated. We strongly recommend that uh, athletes wear masks and that uh, spectators do as well. So uh, they are recommendations, but we also work closely with the VPA uh, to ensure that um, I think there'll be some consistency with that. Um, but it remains to be seen how that will unfold. But I think, you know, just to draw the distinction again between last year and this year, uh, last year we didn't have vaccination. Um, and really our exclusive focus, I think appropriately, was on keeping people safe. I think this year, particularly with vaccination being in our toolkit, we're increasingly focusing on balancing uh, the educational needs of students with their, their risks uh, from the COVID emergency or the COVID pandemic. So um, as we saw last winter, ath athletic activities play a critical role in the mental health and well-being in the educational uh, routine of students. So it's, in it's important that we strive to seek that appropriate balance. And I, I think our recommendations do that. Okay. Thank you everyone for your time. We'll move to Aaron. I just want to offer as well, uh, just that the, I, we believe uh, the VPA is going to follow our guidance. So that question, previous question, might be a better question for them. But we believe that they're going to follow uh, that. Not to take any more time, I, I would just suggest that recreational sports that are operating right now ahead of the high school sports um, Got it. Okay. seem to have a different implementation. Yep, I understand now. Aaron, VT Digger? Can you hear me? We can. Um, I um, I came across a Twitter thread from an appointed official in a small Vermont town, and I'm going to shorten it a little bit for the sake of time, but I wanted to read a couple of quotes from this thread. Every single one of us, regardless of party affiliation or absence of state, is doing that work because we care about our town. Sometimes we have very heated conversations about how best to use our limited resources to best help our community. So we hash it out, we talk, we argue, and we vote. Now it's the pandemic. People don't have a lot of time or money for stretch thin. We are busy arguing about the stuff we have to argue about, and now the governor has decided that we should also have to argue about masks if we're worried about it. 
if we want to have our community safer by having local masking, we have to go have that discussion too, as if our agenda is already, already backed up. It's handy to pass the buck to volunteers and low-level officials who then have to take the brunt of the consequences in our homes where we don't have security detail. Putting the burden of mask mandates on individual towns is actually the same as deciding there will be no mask mandates. Do you have any response to that, Governor? Well, again, the mask mandate isn't my idea. Uh, this is something that the legislative leaders uh, have promoted and asked for. I'm not willing to go there. We're not in, no longer in a state of emergency from my perspective. I don't think a mass mandate uh, is the right approach or any mandates uh, of any uh, significance is the right approach because it's counterproductive. Um, I think we stick to our plan. Um, the, the first thing we need to do is, is to get people who are unvaccinated vaccinated. And I think mass mandates hurt that effort. Again, we're not an outlier here in this state. Uh, 40, uh, 44 states are doing the same thing. And uh, the other states who are doing something different aren't exactly leading uh, the nation either. So we have a difference of opinion on this uh, with the legislature. Uh, so I offered this as a compromise. If they feel as though this isn't what is good for Vermont, um, they don't have to pass it. And I'm perfectly content with that. Obviously, school board meetings have gotten very contentious and heated over the past year. Um, and you've kind of spoken in favor of civility in those situations. Um, what do you have to say about the probable uh, debates and arguments that are going to come up about these potential math mandates? Well, I think debates um, and uh, heated discussion uh, is something that we all experience over, uh, whether it's legislative or on local issues or in school boards and so forth. But I think you can have those debates and something I promoted in, throughout my entire political life, by the way, um, for civili civility and respect. Um, it's something that I practice. Uh, I not only preach it, but I practice it. And, uh, and I would say, uh, you know, find someone who uh, can say otherwise, because this is the way I've led my life. And I think you can have both. I think you can have those debates, those important debates that need to happen. We've had them throughout our history here in Vermont with town meetings. They get heated as well. But it takes calmer heads uh, to prevail. Uh, it takes a common uh, decency and respect and civility, I think, wins the day. So uh, again, I know it's difficult. We're under, everyone is under an incredible amount of stress, but, um, but you know, I think we can have both. And, and by the way, I mean, this isn't my idea. Um, I think you uh, probably saw on some of the media reports, you might have even written about it, um, but um, VLCT, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, this is the organi organization that represents those bodies have advocated for this. They say this is the answer. This is what they want. So this isn't my idea, and I'm just giving them what they want, or I'm at least putting this on the table. So maybe you should be asking VLCT and not me. That's all, thank you. Next, we have Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. Hi, I have a question for Secretary French. Last night at a school board meeting, a parent was, was kind of upset with um, a high school because during the morning announcements, the vaccine was being promoted. Um, I was just wondering if this is something that's happening in other schools, is it sort of being promoted? Is it encouraged? Um, and what your view is on this? I, I'll give my perspective. I think it should be promoted. And, uh, and I hope we get as many um, of our five to 11 year olds, five to 18 year olds vaccinated as possible. But Secretary French. 
Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, as we did with the uh, 12 through 18 vaccination campaign, we provide school districts with information materials uh, to promote vaccination. Uh, we work in partnership with the health department to do that. Um, I will say with the 5 to 11 campaign, uh, we've had to differentiate that strategy a bit as, as we've heard, um, you know, parents who have questions, uh, sometimes it's best to hear from their pediatrician or their family health uh, provider uh, in that regard. So we've been sensitive to um, how best we can support school districts and in providing information to their parents. And sometimes that's a reference to a local health provider or a pediatrician as opposed to the school being the primary uh, disseminator of that information. But um, we, do, we do support vaccination and provide the communications materials for schools to support it as well. Okay, thanks. Um, Governor Scott, I was just wondering if, if you could weigh in um, the cannabis on the Cannabis Control Board's recommendation uh, to legislature that um, one to two percent of the state excise tax on retail sales go to um, municipalities where the retail sales occurred. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think that's, that's fair? I think we'll have to let the legislature debate that. I, I couldn't answer that at this point in time. I'd want to confer with our tax commissioner uh, as well as uh, others in finance. Um, I mean, this, I, I just don't have a, uh, an answer for you at this point. They're an independent, right, thank you. Yeah, they're an independent body and they'll put forward what they, uh, what they feel they need and then the legislature will debate it and we will as well. All right, thanks. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Commissioner Sherman, you still with us here? Mr. Sherling? I, he, he may be on. I'm not sure. I haven't heard from him today. Okay. Um, if he's not, uh, I'll follow up with him. Oh, let, me, let me check. Commissioner Sherling, are you on? He is not responding, Peter. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll reach out and that's all for me, thanks. Thank you. Mike Bielowski, True North uh, Reports. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can. Um, all right, hi, thanks for your time. Um, so this, this past week, some of the national headlines were about how Vermont uh, has been one of the most vaccinated states in the nation, and yet people are still getting the virus at some of the highest rates in the nation. And I know you've, some of you've explained some of it already, some of the nuances, but can you or Dr. Levine speak more to how does this not show that the vaccine strategy uh, might not be working as planned? Well, again, I think if you look at the data, Mike, and Dr. Levine can answer further, but as, as we've said, if you look at the data, uh, it's showing that 70% uh, of those uh, cases, a high number of cases, is amongst the unvaccinated. And that's a pretty, when you start doing the math, that's a pretty small population uh, in regards to, we have, you know, 450, 500,000 people who are vaccinated at this point. And we may have 50 to 100,000, maybe 100,000 uh, total with the five to 11 year olds at this point. Um, who are unvaccinated. So when you look at those percentages, uh, it does skew uh, towards pointing a pretty obvious uh, fact that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated and that's what's driving our cases. But Dr. Levine. Yeah, I'll give the uh, Cliff Notes version of what I said at last week's press conference. When you look at the reasons it has to do with the Delta variant being way more contagious than anything we've encountered before, um, uh, being spread very rapidly by people. It has to do with the fact that uh, we had probably the lowest in the nation rate of people having had COVID prior to the Delta variant. So we had very little immunity in the population uh, for the virus. We also had the most efficient and early vaccine success so that because waning of vaccine uh, immunity is a real phenomenon, 
uh, we would have had a population that was at higher risk for that as well, needing booster. And we have a very mobile population who's uh, been taking advantage of the fact that they've been vaccinated and doing things uh, in person much more than before, uh, including, as we unfortunately saw at Halloween, uh, some gatherings. So again, as the governor said, we have this 50 to 100,000 fold person, young and uh, other ages that uh, have not been vaccinated or are just beginning to get vaccinated. And this variant will find them all, especially at a time like winter uh, when it's getting colder and people are indoors and gathering more under those circumstances. So um, that's sort of the setting the table for what you've been asking about. But again, keep in mind, and you can see it right now in the uh, statistics about those over 65, um, to correct that waning of immunity is not a heavy lift. People just need to present and get their booster shot, and we've made it very easy for them to do that and really have tried to facilitate that. And we're seeing in the 60, 65, and older age group, it's having a significant impact already. And every day now, when I look at our case reports, at the most, we're talking about 15% of the population over age 60 account for some of those cases. So it's everybody younger. Uh, and the most boosted part of the uh, population we have in Vermont and in the country right now is Vermonters over age 65 who, who have really gone to very good extremes to get boosted. So that's very, very important. Um, and just don't lose sight of that. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, if I may real quick, um, I have some data uh, that, that a nurse shared with me on the nurse shortage and the vaccine mandates. I heard uh, you and Guy Page talking about that earlier in the call. He had, he had mentioned, asked about the nurse shortage and if, they, if that was expected to be exasperated by the vaccine mandate. Uh, a nurse shared with me, and this is in one of my articles on the website, True North Report, um, at one hospital at, in Rutland. Now, this includes the assistants, so, so it's not just nurses, it's the, uh, I think they call them RNAs and LNAs, but altogether, it was 87 uh, hospital workers at one hospital that were expected to leave. And I, I just wanted to share that. And I think at UVM Medical Center, the number was much higher. But um, I, I just wanted to share that because I heard it discussed earlier in the call, and I, I thought I might find that interesting. <laughs> And if you want to respond to that, please do. All right, thank you. Oh, thanks for sharing, Mike. We'll look into that and see if that's accurate. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you okay. again next Tuesday.